In Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, uh, uh, chapter two, and the prevalent, the prevalence of, might I say, the negative attitudes of our day, the prevalence of that attitude is forcing us to have to take a look at scriptures that remind us of what the whole gospel message is about. I think it's important simply because the, the nature of the day in which we live for those of you who have your ears on the tracks of the spiritual train, you would have to ask yourself the question, is the Lord about to come and what is the atmosphere in the world when he comes? Because you have to give some thought to the Antichrist. You have to give some thought to the preparation for the Antichrist. You have to give some thought to people being in a state where they would rather hear lies than truth. And what did God say about that? And in dealing with the thin line between holiness, human effort, and the grace of God and the forgiveness of God, the thin line between fruit inspecting and judging. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Fruit inspecting. If you lying to me all the time and I called you a liar, I didn't judge you. I just fruit inspect. I mean, an, if an apple can only come from an apple tree. But there is a thin line between fruit, fruit inspecting and hearing him say, judge not that ye be not judged. For whatever you measure out shall be measured back unto you. There's a thin line between the individual operating in their own strength, declaring that 99 and a half just won't do. And the issues of having righteousness imputed. You see, everybody, I hear people talking, but it seems as if we're neglecting the technicality of a book that is supposed to get us from earth to heaven. And you cannot just deal with this book whimsically or sh on a shallow basis. You have to be a student of the word of God in order to be able to reconcile what seems to be vast differences. On the one hand, I'm expected to live holy, but I cannot live holy without the Holy Spirit. Uh, on the other hand, I'm expected to know who labors among me. But at the same time, I'm told that the wheat and the tears have to grow together. And it is not my job to separate wheat from tears. At the same time, I have to understand that the blind shall lead the blind and they both shall fall in the ditch. But I had problems with that. Because I said to God, uh, I can understand that the first blind man needs to fall in the ditch because he knew he was blind and he presumed to lead. He had the presumption, the, you know, he had the audacity to decide that he was a leader and he can't see. So I didn't feel any uh, compassion for him falling into the ditch. But I said to the Lord, I said, but God, what about the second fella who just latched on and end up in the ditch following the first blind fellow who couldn't see? But then, after years of struggling, it came to me that a blind person ought to know the symptoms of blindness. 
So if you latch on to somebody and you keep running into a tree and into a post, you ought to ask, can you see? <laughs> to reconcile the scriptures when it comes to holiness and to whom little is given, little is required, to whom much is given, much is required, but to whom much is given, all is not required. Because in order to require all from anybody, you got to give them all. And the only one who has all is the Almighty. I don't know anyone in this room who I could put a halo over their heads and say that they have it made and it's already done. It's already done in heaven because God is going to make the difference. But it is difficult to be able to operate in a world where you have to know them that labor among you and yet move through here without making any negative judgments. So I'll ask the question, who in here did God raise up to be the judge of others? Who did God raise up to be the punishment for the person that's sitting beside you? Who did God raise up to walk through this house and to decide who is right and who is wrong? I don't want that job. I would rather go down on the side of compassion than on the side of being rigid and mean. I want to take you to the scriptures because I think it's important and uh, to go to Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and he says, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work only in he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they have received not the love of truth that they might be saved. And because they don't have that love of truth, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, one of the things that I hear often and that is that there is a great falling away now. It's interesting. And everyone is saying that precluding, that a preclude to the coming of the Lord is that there's going to be a great falling away. You hear that from one group. And then on the other hand, the next group, uh, declares that there's going to be an end time revival. Now which one is it going to be? And we take this particular scripture and we say the Bible says that there is going to be a falling away. 
Now, from an eschatological point of view, we have to ask, this falling away, when is it going to happen? Is it pre-rapture or is it post-rapture? Now, I'm going to be real technical. You've got to follow me uh, real close here. Notice what Paul is saying here. He says, remember ye not, verse 5, when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So it would seem to me that when he was speaking of the falling away before the man of sin be revealed, it seems to me that he is declaring that he taught them this while he was with them. Could I logically come to that conclusion? While I was yet with you, I taught you these things. So now the question is, is that statement significant enough to pinpoint what it is he is saying to us when he's talking about us being gathered with Christ when he comes? Is he pinpointing something that we can rationalize and intellectually come to some sort of uh, conclusion that gives us the timing. Now, come with me now. We're going to slip back to 1 Thessalonians and we're going to chapter 5, I believe or it could be chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 13, he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. I would not have you to be ignorant, would suggest that what he is teaching them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, what he is teaching them, he is telling them that now for the first time. I would not have you to be ignorant. He is not saying I taught you this before, and I want to bring this to your remembrance. So I'm going to then, uh, through some sort of logical deduction, declare that when he taught them about the rapture, and the rapture or the parousia includes the dead in Christ rising first, and those who are living together, they're caught up to meet God in the air. Which means, Jesus said, he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. So he's talking about two categories. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, dead. And he that believeth on me, oh, if he never dies, so that means he's alive. So we've got the dead and the living. Uh, look at your neighbor and say, I believe in Christ. So I'm wanted, dead or alive. He is teaching them that they should comfort one another 
because when you lose a loved one, it's not over. That's what he's teaching. Because if you're in Christ, it doesn't matter whether you're dead or alive because you're in Christ. So I would say that the body of Christ now is existing with living folk and dead folk. Because now I need you to comfort one another with these words. Now, he says to the Corinthian church, don't act when people die as someone who hath no hope. Because if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. Christianity has given the impression that the relationship with God is strictly material. But I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. So you ain't taking nothing with you but your soul. So I cannot ignore the gospel message about people being saved because salvation is the only thing you can take into eternity. Amen. So you say you own your house, you own your car, take it with you. Amen. The Lord just loaned you. I don't know why you envious of somebody else's loan. It's a loan. I don't care how nice it is, I'm not going to have it forever. Amen. My body's tearing up. I'm looking at them showing me birthday years ago. I'm walking straight. Now I'm leaning over. You got to understand that this thing is a soul thing. Amen. This whole reason of sitting here today is about your soul. And, and I'm not looking at somebody else and I'm envious about what you drive or what you wear. It don't matter to me. It's your soul. But when we begin to make and focus on Jesus Christ and make it things, then we leave people disappointed if they don't move to the next level financially. But there's some beautiful people that I know who are broke. And some ugly people. Where all they think about is money and grabbing and getting and gaining. And they do anything to get it. And tear you apart if they can't get it. Because envy is such an ugly thing. But don't be mad with me, I just have more credit with God. So I just have more credit because it ain't mine. The earth is the Lord's. The fullness of it. So the point I'm making here is that he taught them about the revelation of the Antichrist when he talks about great falling away because he is teaching them in 1 Thessalonians about the rapture. Now notice now, the dead will never be able to say, oh grave, no, the dead will never be able to say, oh death, where is your sting? Because everybody who died would have felt the sting of death. But the dead will be able to say, oh grave, where is your victory? Because corruption shall put on incorruptibility, that's for those who are dead. For those who are living, mortal shall put on immortality. And that's all at the rapture. So when he's talking about great falling away in Thessalonians chapter 2, he is not talking about rapture. Stay with me now. I told you it'd be a little complicated. I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
and by our gathering together unto him that ye should not soon be shaken in mind or troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us at the day of Christ's at hand. Let no man deceive you for that day shall not come except their coming of falling away first. Now, if there's going to be a gathering together in Christ, and he says, brethren, I think it's critical to understand that he always speaks of his brothers in Christ in a very special way because it is impossible for me to intellectually grasp that I'm going to be with you in eternity and I don't like you here. Uh, you know, today, my subject, before they put all that stuff up there and, and got all cuddly and mushy, my subject today would have been, where is the love? Amen. And then I come here and they got all this cuddly, smushy stuff. In, <laughs> and then it, you know, sort of bothers your mind. He uses expressions of endearment when he is talking about his brethren. Because there has to be a significant amount of love that operates within the body of Christ. You cannot have a body that eats itself. And one of the things that's so significant is that he never deals with us from any other significant analogy than a body. Look at the analogy that he's bringing. What part of your body does not give support to the other? The doctor is telling me now because my back was out of whack, I end up messing my hip and then the other doctor said probably it's the hip that's the reason the back is out of whack but what each one of them is saying is there is a connection Jesus says and he makes it very clear that they shall know ye are my disciples because of a connection and that connection is love. 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 Now it is interesting that depending on how we were formed and in our early lives there is a formation because we come in here literally blank. And the experiences of early life oftentimes sets us in a certain pattern. And that pattern that we are set in, that mold that forms us in our early life becomes very difficult to break. So don't get too quiet now. I don't want you going back too far in your, in your history. And now, I have had certain incidents happen to me at seven years old. And at 30 years old, I was still feeling it. Because in your formative years, this is why we have parents or we have somebody that God ordains to bring us up in a way that gives us less stress and less pain when we get older. I 
I need as a child and you and I needed people as children who were more concerned about our first experiences than their exploitation. One of the most difficult things to get over is to have to forgive someone who should have been protecting you, but they abused you. I mean, we might as well just, uh, ain't no other way to approach it, saints. Ain't no other way. And because of those early negative experiences, one psychologist says that grown folk are simply children trying to get over their earlier experiences. Now here comes Jesus. Jesus comes into a situation where most of us are narcissistic and selfish and egomaniacal. I was taught uh, early in life, you, you got to get it while you can. You got to go after it. You got to give up some, don't, don't you party, you got to study. You got to work hard because you got to be successful. My mother would say, you got the Jones name. You got to live up to that name. So we are all taught to be aggressive about gain, success. And it almost teaches you to be ruthless and impatient. You gotta get it now. You gotta get it while you can enjoy it. Cause you're gonna get old. And you can't enjoy it. And we get nervous when the years begin to count until some of us won't even tell our age. As if it's a curse to be old. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus says, be patient. Totally antithetical to how I was early, my early formation. Then Jesus says, prefer your brother. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully Can you imagine the upheaval? Can you imagine the contradiction that flows through the average person who is trying to be a Christian? In an atmosphere where if you show kindness, people think it's weak. And our defenses are always up because we've been hurt so much we don't trust anybody. I am supposed to trust. Can I say that again? I'm supposed to trust. I'm supposed to be in your presence and not worry about you cutting me in the back when I walk away from you. I, I'm supposed to be able to speak my heart yes, sir. Yes, sir. and not worry that somebody is going to use it to crucify me later. Supposed to trust. But I can't. I'm supposed to come here and not make a judgment of you but enjoy who you are. I'm not supposed to come in here and look at you critically as if you were some kind of devil getting ready to do something to me. I'm supposed to come down here and shake your hand and not be worried about somebody taking a swing at me. Now I got to hire security. And I'm not at the club. I wish somebody talked to me in this house. 
I'm hiring security and I'm not selling dope. I'm over here selling hope and I got to have security. And in order to get the right kind of security, I got to get the dope man security. In the church. I used to have church security, but they didn't work out. They weren't tough enough to deal with the saints. I need to talk to the saints, man. I feel like crying. You don't understand. The church ought to be a place where people love one another, where people enjoy each other. It ain't supposed to be a place where you're scared to come in. You're scared to open your mouth. You don't know what somebody's going to say about you, how somebody's going to treat you. It shouldn't be in the house of God. Paul who arguably, not arguably, without, without question, is the most profound theological mind that Christianity has ever had. And with all of the accolades that you could give him, and he has many, if you look at how he approaches his brethren, now we beseech you Notice what he's saying here. He's saying essentially, now I beg you. I implore you. He's in a position where he could command, demand, and he could be very ugly about his presentation. But he refuses to deal with them other than in a loving and kind manner. And it don't think that for one minute he doesn't understand that the people that he's talking to within the parameters of the Thessalonian church don't have a struggle. He understands that they struggle. He understands that any human being who is brought into an atmosphere where he's called on to love his enemies is having a struggle. Because what we did was we decided not to go with the intensity of what holiness is and that's loving your enemies, doing good to them that despitefully use you, caring for people, treating people with dignity and respect. So what we did was we took the easy way out, we just went to close. So we said if you dress a certain way, you're fine. If you look a certain way, you're fine. I grew up, you couldn't wear shoes with the toes out. You couldn't wear shoes with the heels out. You had to have your dresses all the way down here and all the way up to your neck. You couldn't show any flesh nowhere. You had to have stockings because you couldn't wear pantyhose. And in the middle of that, all we ended up with people looking at other people making judgments. So we had a whole lot of folk who were dressed right, dressed tight, but mean as nine butcher knives because their concern was how you look on the outside, didn't care nothing about your heart on the inside. I, I want you to, to just look, look, at, look at how he talks to them. 
because I think it's, it's important to understand how he talks. He deals with them when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. He deals with them in a manner that says, we're not only going to be together here, but we're going to be together in eternity. And when I speak to brethren as he speaks, he's speaking about the strongest one of us and the weakest one of us at the same time. He is not making a distinction between who is greater or who is more significant than the other. Because in the body of Christ, there are different levels of maturity in Christ. But that does not mean you're not a part of his body. And the power of being in the body of Christ is the strong should bear the infirmities of the weak. The strong is not supposed to abuse and mistreat the weak. That's what we do in the world. Oh, I wish somebody would understand me. This is something to shout about. That's what we do in the world. That's what Jacob did to Esau. That's what we do in competition. When I'm in competition with you, I look for your weakness. And I exploit your weakness. Oh, you're going to see it today? You're going to see it today with the Lions against the 49ers? You're going to see it today? You're going to see it? with the Ravens against uh, Kansas City Chiefs, you gonna see it today. You gonna see a group of men looking over there at the other side with their teeth. And they gonna be looking for the weakness of the other team and they are gonna exploit it. Oh yeah, we gonna throw on that rookie. There's that rookie down there. Go on down there, we gonna throw right there. We want one on one. And we're going to get that rookie out of there. Let somebody get hurt. Uh -huh. Bring him back in here if you choose. That is not the spirit of God. That is not the spirit of the house of God. You don't walk around here looking to exploit and put people's weaknesses on media. Why don't you put their strength and put what they have done to bless somebody else? Why don't you talk about somebody's goodness and somebody's strength? Everybody's got something somewhere. If you dig deep enough, you will find something wrong. But nobody is walking out here publicizing their wrong. They publicize what's good. They publicize their victory. You tell stories of what God brought you out of. You don't tell stories of what you're still in. I feel like lifting him up. I feel like giving God the glory. Give somebody a high five and say, I'm a child of God. I'm not always perfect, but I'm always his. I'm not always on the mountain top, but he's always with me. I'm getting ready to close. Give some money a high five and say, neighbor, remember what he said. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you when you're hurt. I'll never leave you when you're burdened down. I'll never leave you when you're messed up. I'll never leave you when you can't praise me. I'll never leave you when you're complaining. I'll never leave you when you won't come to church. I'll never leave you when you don't call my name. I'll never leave you when you don't lift me up. I'll never leave when you're struggling. I'll never leave when you're down in sin. I'll never leave because I am the way maker. I am the healer. I am the savior. My blood washes you. My blood cleanses you. I will always feel like shouting in here. 
give somebody a high five. Say, neighbor, where is the love? Where is the love that should run through the house? Where is the love that should flow through the house of God? Touch three people real quick and say, I love you, and you can't do anything about it. I love you from the depth of my heart. in here. I feel the love. Touch two people real quick. Say, I want to feel the love. I work better with love. I talk better with love. I do more with love. I get deep with love. I help you out with love. 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 How did we get here? Get so messed up. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust sweet refrain but holy lean on Jesus name one time on Christ the solid rock I stand oh. sinking sand if you're here and the Lord's calling you if you're online I want you to reach for your phone and call 844-267-7729. Somebody's there waiting for it. All of the ground sinking sand. Woo. Call, somebody's waiting for you. If you're in this building and you have not met the love of God, met the God of love, but you haven't met the love of God. Come on, come on, come on. This is what church is about. We'll throw our arms around you. We'll wrap our arms around you. Because your life is important. One more time. On Christ, the solid rock. 